It started. Didn't bring you back. Ah. Uh, okay, today. Don't repeat. Awesome. Uh, and today's going to be really good. Today's going to be cool because we are going to forget about all that fancy schmancy abstract mathematics, all the bundles and crap. No, sorry, not bundles. Manifolds and crap. Bundles are important, but they're not important to this class so much. Anyway, we're going to. We're going to let go of all that abstract math, and what we're going to do today is we're going to do a lot of math, but it's all very understandable math, okay? But there's going to be a lot of it. However, at the very end, you're going to go, well, holy shit. <laughs> I had no idea, okay? So, so buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a bit of a ride, but when we get to the end, you'll be like, well, damn. You have a lot of responses. Well, just give me your responses out loud, okay? All right, let's go. So uh, to get started, recall the very important last observation that was made at the end of the last lecture. And that is, we have a tensor transformation law. <laughs> I've got my mask on today, which will not stay over my nose. And the reason for that, in case you wonder, is I have a beard. And the beard grabs it and pulls it down. There I go. I think that will be. I don't know how stupid that looks, but it'll work. <laughs> okay, anyway. It's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so remember, um, if we had a tensor, say a lower end and upper index tensor, and it was truly a tensor, it would transform like this. Uh, dx mu, dx mu prime, dx mu prime, dx mu, t mu nu, okay? And we have the partial derivative transformation law. Oops, partial derivative transformation. to remind you of this because this is going to be the seed of what we're going to talk about today. This led us to the observation that if we take the derivative of, say, a vector tensor, okay, then this thing, whoa, that's kind of fun. Maybe I'll do that more often. Uh, this is going to transform in the following sense. Where again, I'm not going to just say, oh, this is a mu nu tensor. I'm actually going to transform the derivative, and I'm going to transform the tensor. And the combination of those is unfortunately not going to give me an overall tensor for this. And so we talked about last time what this gives us. It begins with the breakdown of the derivative transformation. But that acts upon the entirety of the tensor transform or the vector transformation. Okay, and in the end gives us this starting out clean expression in terms of a normal tensor transformation rule. Okay, so that's how we would love for this thing to transform if it was truly a tensor, because that's how a tensor transforms. But due to the product rule, the d mu is also going to act on this thing, because in general, these coordinate transformations are functions themselves. Okay? So we're going to get a contribution from the derivative acting on this. And that is what is going to break this from transforming like a true tensor. And I'm sure I'm going to regret writing this where I wrote it on the board. But oh well, that's the way it works. OK, so remember, this is tensorial. So if that was the end of the story, we'd say, yeah, the derivative is a tensor, but unfortunately it has this non-tensorial piece, which is ruining its tensor day. OK? Now, um, hold on just a second. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I want 
often to know something. There is one tensor whose derivative is a tensor. Any takers? Oh, let me, let me, let me get a taker. Hannah. Hannah? No, Hannah. Sam. Sam? <coughs> Sam. What tensor do you think the derivative of is as well a tensor? Uh, a tensor of constant? Of uh, constant? What, what, do you, what do you mean by constant? Um, just uh, your neighbor. Sorry, say it one more time. All of the combined are zero numbers. Well, actually, what that would do is that would make this derivative zero, but the non tensorial part might still be not zero. And that's what's screwing it up. So, how can I avoid not having the non tensorial part? You can find it. Oh, I got a hand in the back of the room. I'm going to let you paint it up for you. Say it again. You could use a zero tensor. Nope, that would still, well, well, yeah, that's kind of boring. It works. No, not a zero tensor, not a zero tensor. So another tensor. Where is this factor popping up from? This is popping up from the derivative acting on the transformation of the tensor. So how can I avoid the derivative acting on the transformation of a tensor? Indemnity. If it doesn't transform? If it doesn't transform, i.e. if it is a? Yeah. Scalar. Scalar. Scalar, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, if our tensor has no indices, then this transforms like an honest to God tensor. And that's precisely because what's in this parentheses is just the, the, the constant, not the constant, it doesn't have to be constant, but the scalar, okay? There's a difference between things being constant or non-constant and things being tensors versus scalars. Whether it's a tensor versus a scalar is how does it transform. Whether it's constant or not constant is the functional dependence of this, which we don't really illustrate because in general things can depend on location. Okay, so in general, just the same things depend on where you are. Okay, but at any rate, does everybody, does that make sense to everyone? This is an important observation we'll make use of later on. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I, used to, I used to call this topic episode four, A New Hope. And I don't really think this is uh, really like, Relevant anymore. <laughs> anyway, this is the anti target. Anyway, we need a new what? We need a new derivative. Okay, this derivative is just not cutting it. We want a derivative such that the derivative of a tensor is a tensor. So, we will call the derivative del mu. And it will take the form of the partial derivative plus something. Because after all, the partial derivative does give us the tensor behavior plus something. And so if we add to this the thing that will actually cancel this when we do a transformation, then this whole story might work out. Okay? So now what I'm going to add to it right now is going to be have one lower index because it has to have the same lower index as the derivative. We know that. And it's also going to have two other spots where indices will go, but it's based on what it's acting on. So I can't really give them labels right now. Okay? Now, there are some important properties 
that we can insist this derivative satisfy, and in fact, we are gonna use these properties to build up what this derivative should look like, okay? So first of all, we have two properties which are basically going to provide us with some useful information, which I'll tell you in just a second. First is that del mu should be a good derivative. And what I mean by that is it should obey the linearity condition and the Leibniz transformation rule. Or the, sorry, the Leibniz, it's basically the product rule. Secondly, del mu v nu should be a tensor, okay? B is obvious. This is the derivative acting on the vector, and we just want that to be a tensor. So we knew we were gonna demand this. This is just kind of like, is it satisfying the usual requirements of the derivative operator? Okay, and I'll show you what those are in just a moment. Once we require these two things, we will have established what we call the connections on vectors, okay? This thing right here, just to give it a name, is often called a connection. And I'm gonna give an interpretation of what the connection does at the end of this lecture, okay? But whenever I use the word connection, I'm referring to this new term that we're adding to the old derivative, okay? It's called connection. Okay, so there are more requirements. So C and D, we have C, del mu, should commute with contractions. Okay, and I'll show you explicitly what I mean by that in due time. And then we have del mu should reduce partial mu when acting on what? Scalars. And scalars, yes, thank you. That's what we just argued. Okay? After we have applied these two criteria, which I'm going to do all this in detail, this extends it to tensors. Okay? So after we've established A and B, we'll be able to take the, 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 the derivative of a vector, and it will satisfy all the properties, but to extend that to the derivative of tensors in general, we'll have to apply these, sec these third and fourth properties. And then we have two more. And these are actually very special. First, we're going to demand that the connection is torsion-free. Don't worry, I know you don't know what the word torsion is, or you might have an idea, but I'm going to make it explicit. And then we're going to demand metric compatibility. When we do this, we will get specialized to a specific expression for this. Applying the first four criteria could still offer us different ways of introducing this connection, but if we apply these last two, there's only one formula for this that will exist, and that is called the Christoffel connection. Okay? And that's what we're going to use in this class. Okay? So we're going to go through each of these, one at a time building up to our final expression for the Christoffel connection. And then once we, of course, have the Christoffel connection, that will give us the full definition of our derivative, and I'm gonna go ahead and give this a name. This derivative is called the covariant derivative. Again, as promised, the math here is going to be 
straightforward. I'm just going to write tensors with indices and derivatives, and I'm going to hit things and bang things and shuffle things around, but I'm not going to talk about manifolds or tangent spaces or any of that shit, okay? So you can follow this. It's just a little tedious. So here we go with A. Let's start with linearity. Linearity says if I take the derivative of the sum of two tensors, then this should just be the derivative acting on each tensor and then the sum of that. And then the Leibniz is that if I take the derivative of the product of two tensors, and don't worry, we won't worry about the product in this class. We don't really need to, but just trying to be precise. Then we get something which looks a lot like the product rule from calculus, okay? And both are satisfied by the following definition. Del mu v mu equals d mu v mu plus the connection with its indices set like that. Okay? So this is just a linear transformation of the vector. Okay? Of course, that establishes the linearity. But let's show it in detail. If I do del mu of t nu plus s nu, so I'm going to work in terms of the components, okay? This you can think of as the uh, entirety of the derivative operator, which has a basis, and then the tensors, which have a basis. But if we just talk about it in terms of components, then we can do this. We can say, okay, this is d nu, d nu plus s nu plus gamma nu nu lambda t lambda plus s lambda, okay? Now all I want is to show that this gives me this. You think I can do that? <laughs> Hell yeah, man, I mean, come on. D mu t nu plus b mu s nu plus gamma nu u lambda t lambda plus gamma nu mu lambda s lambda. Now I just take this and I put it next to that and I call it that. I take this, I put it next to that, and I call it that. I'm done. Boom. Linearity. Satisfied. Okay? Yes? Uh, so for your tensor t's, or uh, actually, no, sorry, the gammas, uh, is that like the new and the new stack on top of each other? Sorry, say it again? For the gammas, where you have the new in the subscript or superscript, and new in the subscript, does it, it matter, I guess, which like comes first, left or right? Uh, do you mean the top versus the bottom? Yeah. Or well, you're not going to write these as a matrix. Okay. They're three index objects, so don't worry about which. So yeah, I mean, it's not as important because you're never going to cast this in terms of a matrix. Okay. So the positioning of the upper with respect to the lower is not that important. Okay. Um, hold on just a second. Oh. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right. So at the end of the day, this of course equals uh, del mu t nu plus del mu s nu. Okay. So that works. Um, all right. Now let's do the product rule. So if I do del nu t nu s lambda, okay, again, this product is a bit complicated, but of course the complication of the product is always an expression in terms of what you're actually doing with the basis. When you're working with the coefficients or the components of a tensor, you're just multiplying numbers together. So that's why I write t lambda times, or t nu times s lambda. At any rate, d nu t nu s lambda plus gamma nu mu alpha t alpha s lambda plus gamma lambda mu beta t mu s beta. And then of course we can do t mu t nu times s lambda plus t nu t mu s lambda plus gamma nu 
mu alpha p alpha times s lambda plus p nu gamma lambda mu beta s beta. And we should be able to ID, identify this as gamma nu p nu nu times s lambda plus p nu times delta s mu lambda. Okay? <sighs> Not too bad. I told you there'd be a tedium of indices to keep track of, but overall, nothing weird. Okay, now, here is where we get some money. Okay, so I'm gonna erase all this unless anybody has any questions, because I need the space. Okay. So really and truthfully, this is our working definition. And now for B, we want, of course, that uh, delta nu V nu should be a tensor, so we want delta nu V nu to transform as dx mu, dx mu prime, dx mu prime, dx mu, del mu, v mu, okay? Now this contains the transformed version of the connection. This contains the non-transformed version of the connection. Okay? I mean, again, so delta mu prime, nu prime, just put primes on all of these. So this is clearly gamma mu, nu prime, mu prime, lambda prime. That's what's in here. And of course, this has no primes, so it should just be gamma nu mu lambda. Okay? Now, I am not going to do this. I'm just going to show you the answer. Okay? For this to work out, because we know how gamma lambda, we know how the derivative, this transforms, and we know how this transforms. In order for this to happen, we need the gamma to transform in the following sense. Gamma must transform as dx mu, dx mu prime, d lambda, d lambda prime, dx lambda, Dx lambda prime, dx mu prime, dx mu, gamma nu mu lambda. Okay? Gus. Gus? Yes. Gus, am I done? Um, I, I don't think so. Well, if I was done, what would this gamma be? Um, it would be too far to have another, like a non tensor Right, exactly. If, I, if this was the end of the story, then gamma would be a tensor, because this is how a tensor transforms. But remember, <laughs> this term is being introduced to cancel off the non-tensorial part of the derivative. So you should expect that this thing itself should not be a tensor. The only way you can cancel off a non-tensorial piece is with another non-tensorial piece. Make sense? Of course, you can start with a tensorial piece, but this should have another piece, and it does. So it turns out that this has an additional piece, which is dx mu, dx mu prime, dx lambda, dx lambda prime, d2 x nu prime dx mu dx lambda. Okay? So, once again, tensorial, non-tensorial. And I want you all to recognize as Sean, or Sean, Sean, as Sean will point out, what do you notice is so interesting about these terms? 
are very similar to the tensorial terms? They are, except what, what happens to these terms if the transformation you're considering is constant? It's like a Lorentz transformation. So do they go to zero? They go to zero because this is the derivative of the transformation itself. So if the transformation happens to be super simple, like a Lorentz transformation, which is just full of constants, this whole thing drops off. Of course, the whole insistence of this drops off because this derivative is a tensor if you're only dealing with transformations that are made of constants. Okay? It's a good observation. Um, is yeah. There a Sorry, is there a dx lambda? Or dx, yeah, a dx lambda, dx lambda prime thing that you wrote there. Uh, the dx, this right here? Yeah, I guess I don't see how that comes into the gratuitous expression because it looks like if it, that contains the gamma with three primes and we're only doing two transformations, I guess I don't see where the third prime comes from. Um, question. So, so this has mu and nu. You've got mu and nu, and your question is, where is this lambda coming from? How does it end up prime? Um, it feels like we would need a third transformation for that. How does the lambda end up prime? Yeah. Well, I mean, that transformation right there does the priming of it, but I mean, you've got this correction term. I mean, I mean, how do all three of these become primed is just given by these three operations. Yeah, I just don't see where that is in the, the other expression. Which yeah. one? That one. This one? Yeah. Well, it's contained in here, so, um, so re remember that del mu v nu is del mu v nu plus gamma nu mu lambda v lambda. So the lambda is part of the sum that appears here. So it doesn't appear here because the lambda summed over. Okay. But we transform the components of this and we transform all of the components of this. So that's where lambda is entering the story. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. Well, I, let me, let me hammer on a bit, and then at the end of this, we'll come back to a, a surprising outcome, which might make it a little bit more palatable. Okay. Uh, all right, so, okay, good. So this is the connection transformation law. You should write it down, because this is a very, very important and useful result. If we transform the coordinates, that is exactly how the connection should transform so that whatever we're taking, or if we take the derivative of a vector, this is only for a vector, then the derivative of a vector itself will be a, a tensor. Okay? We good? All right, so, so far we've done A and B, and now we have the form of a connection on a vector. We just need an object which includes a linear transformation. And I guess I wrote this right here. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Anyway. Um, but anyway, so the, the, co the covariant derivative of the vector includes a linear transformation of the vector. And as long as it satisfies this transformation, okay, then B is satisfied and we have a covariant derivative on a vector. Now we would like to extend that to the covariant derivative on an arbitrary tensor, okay? So let us continue our story, and I'm sure I'm gonna regret erasing anything, but that's the way the story goes. All right, Ugh. So let's look at C for a moment. In C, we have that we would like for the covariant derivative to commute with 
contractions, and a contraction is just the sum over an index. So if I have a tensor t mu nu, and then I set the two indices the same, if I just call it lambda. But if I set the two indices the same, this is called the contraction, okay? And what I would like is for this to be the same as delta t mu lambda lambda. Okay, so I'll make sense of this in just a moment. Um, so here we go. So delta mu, first of all, if I have the contraction over the indices of the tensor, I can always uh, dis distinguish the two indices of the tensor and then just hit it with the delta function. Okay? Because we know the chronic or delta is just going to grab this lambda and turn it into a new, or it's going to grab the new and turn it into a lambda, which is obviously what I have here. Okay, it doesn't matter. You can call it lambda, lambda, or new, new. It doesn't matter. As long as they're the same, they're summed over. Well, hold on. We have the Leibniz rule. So that means that we can take this and we can hit each one of them with it. exactly what we would call delta t mu lambda lambda. So this implies that the chronic or delta, the thing we're using to contract indices, should be covariantly constant. Now you're going to appreciate that because that does not mean that it's constant. Okay? And I'm going to give you a very, very explicit explanation for what I mean by covariantly constant versus constant. But generally speaking, if the del mu of something vanishes, that does not mean that d mu of it vanishes. Because del mu is d mu plus the connection. And if the combination is zero, then if the connection is non zero, then the d mu is non zero. Okay? So this is not. This is not constant, it's covariantly constant. And again, I'm going to give you a picture of what to think of that in a few minutes. Okay, so then D, D says the del mu of a scalar should just be D mu of a scalar. That is, the covariant derivative should just reduce to the ordinary partial derivative. But guess what we can do? How in the world are we going to be able to apply this to tensors? Jared. Jared. How can I take this simple observation of the del mu acting on a scalar, reducing to this, and somehow milk it for information about vectors and dual vectors and all that crap? Relate a scalar to a vector and a dual vector? Be a tensor? Uh, well, what kind of tensor? Uh, rank two tensor. How are you going to relate a scalar to a rank two tensor? You can do this. Transformation at law of tensors? I'm not sure. Well, is there anything special about that second rank tensor that you're doing? Related to a scalar? I'm not sure. What about that? What is the, what is T lambda lambda? Is that a scalar? Yeah, it's summed over. There's no free index on that. So a gen more general a, a more general statement of this is if we take the covariant derivative of a dual vector contracted with a vector, okay, this is just a scalar. If you
you take a dual vector and contract it with a vector, these indices are summed over. So there's no free indices here. This thing is just a scalar. However, it's built from a dual vector and a vector. So if we take the derivative and we use the Leibniz rule on this, we're going to get the connection in here. But at the end of the day, this has to play the game of just the ordinary derivative. So you'll see what I mean when I do this. So let's break this up. So this can become del mu omega lambda times v lambda plus omega lambda times del mu v lambda. Okay, that's just using the Leibniz rule. Okay. And now, I know how this works out. I'm not sure how this works out. This is the covariant derivative acting on a dual vector, which is not a vector. So I'm just going to guess what this looks like, and then we'll figure out exactly what it's supposed to look like in just a moment. So I'm going to guess that this looks like the following. Partial mu omega lambda plus gamma twiddle sigma mu lambda omega sigma so I'm saying that this covariant derivative acting on a dual vector again starts with just the normal partial derivative and then there's some correction I'm not saying it's the exact same correction that we use on vectors. That's why I got the twiddle. But still, for this derivative to satisfy these properties, you can kind of guess that it's going to take roughly the same form. Okay? And then, of course, that term is just multiplied by the vector lambda, v lambda. And then we know what happens with the next term. We have v mu v lambda plus gamma lambda mu nu v nu. Okay? This is just the standard expression that we would use for this. Okay? Now everybody fasten your seatbelts. I am just going to take the partial derivatives, collect them, and then take these funky connection terms and push them out to the end. So in the end, this is going to be v mu omega lambda v lambda plus omega lambda v mu v lambda plus gamma twiddle sigma mu lambda omega sigma v, v lambda plus gamma lambda mu nu omega lambda v nu. Okay? Let me pick another victim. Ben! Ben. This is the covariant derivative of a vector. Oh, scalar. Scalar. Okay. So this is just explicitly treating that in all its gory detail. We would like for this to be equal to what? Exactly. What needs to vanish? All of the extra stuff? Yeah, everything that has the connection in it. Because if this is all zero, then this just involves the partial derivative, which is how you expect this to reduce to a scalar. Did everybody follow that? Because I'm going to take this and set it equal to zero. Okay? So this means that gamma twiddle sigma mu lambda omega sigma v lambda will need to be equal to minus gamma lambda mu nu omega lambda v nu. Okay? Now, that might look a little crazy, but I'm about to just do a little variable gymnastics to make it obvious. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this, and I'm going to rename 
paint some of the indices that are summed over because this has got lambda lambda. I don't call lambda anything else. I call it happy. I call it happy face. Happy face. Happy face. Call it anything you want. Okay. Now, but in, in truth, what we're going to do is we're going to rename uh, lambda to be sigma, and we're going to rename nu to be lambda, and so this is going to become minus gamma sigma mu lambda omega sigma v lambda, which now you can compare to this. It's hard to figure out how gamma twiddle is related to gamma if this is omega sigma v lambda and this is omega lambda v nu, but now this is omega sigma v lambda. So I'm going to ask the hardest question of the entire day to PJ. PJ. Don't get too stressed out. How is gamma sigma related to gamma? Except negative? Exactly. That's it. Gamma sigma is minus gamma. Okay? Well, what this, of course, means is that a dual vector transforms in almost exactly the same way as a vector. The big difference is we have a minus, where for the vector we have a plus, and I've already erased the vector. Okay? Does that make sense? Just a minus. Okay? Well, wait a minute. We know how to transform a vector, and we know how to transform a dual vector. What do we really know how to transform? Say it again? Any tensor? Any tensor. Because any tensor is just a collection of vector indices and dual vector indices. So if you have any tensor, say you have a tensor T alpha beta, then this is going to be V mu T alpha beta plus gamma alpha mu lambda T lambda beta minus gamma delta mu beta Okay. So when you're doing the covariate derivative of all the tensor, you always start out by just the derivative of the tensor, and then you have to add in these connection corrections, one for each index, whether it's vector or dual vector. Okay? So now we have Covariant derivative of the tensor, as promised. Make sense? Okay. Any questions before we pass on? this on the board. I can do it on paper, but uh, gamma, oh yeah, yeah. So, no, 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 no. Uh, mu beta, no, this, oh shit, I'll just look at what I have here. <laughs>
Mu, beta, alpha. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, now it's going to get especially crazy. So once we get to the end of this, we'll have an expression for what the gammas are. And then I'll give you some interpretation of what the hell they're doing. OK? Um, I hope I get this. All right, so here we go. So moving along to D, or sorry, uh, no, E, C, D, E, E. So we want our connection be torsion free. I'm sure I'm going to regret having written this down. Okay, so first of all, let us consider two different connections because, as I mentioned, right now, so far, with everything that we've applied, criteria A, B, and C, we haven't uniquely figured out what gamma is. There's actually different versions of gamma that you could do. So let's just imagine that we had two different versions of gamma in, in our hands. Um, we'll call one of them gamma lambda mu nu, and we'll just call the other one gamma twiddle again. This is not the gamma for, uh, for a dual vector. This is just a different gamma than the first one. Okay. And now what I want to do is I want to form the difference of the covariant derivative using this gamma and the covariant derivative using this gamma on a vector lambda, okay? First and foremost, what kind of object is that? The difference of two tensors, which the difference of two tensors should be? A tensor, this is a tensor. Okay, that'll be an important observation in just a moment, okay? So we can write this down, d nu v lambda plus gamma lambda mu nu v nu minus d nu v lambda minus gamma twiddle lambda mu nu v nu. Oh, look at that. What do those equal? I mean, they're the same thing, so the difference is zero. zero, exactly. So this is just going to come out to be gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma twiddle lambda mu nu on v nu, okay? What must that be? combination of gammas have to be? This combination of gammas times a vector is equal to what? A tensor. A tensor. So what must this difference of two connections be? A tensor. I want you to remember, gamma is not a tensor. Remember? If we transform gamma, we get the tensorial part plus the non-tensorial part. However, if I take any two gammas, two different gammas, and I subtract them, their difference must be a tensor. Pretty interesting, right? Now, what that means, of course, is that we can take gamma mu nu, and we can form gamma lambda mu nu, and we can we can form what is called T lambda mu nu, which is just gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma lambda nu mu, which is of course two times gamma lambda times the anti-symmetrized combination of the lower two indices. Okay. This is a tensor. It's just the difference of two connections, okay? This is called the torsion tensor. However, in general,
literal, we can take any gamma matrix, and this is something which you may or may not know, I hope you know, and you can always break it down into a symmetric and an anti-symmetric combination of the two lower indices. Is there anybody that is not familiar with this idea? We're all familiar with this idea? Okay, good. Okay, so what this means is this is just an arbitrary connection. This is not a tensor. This is a tensor. This, therefore, is what? Not a tensor. Remember, one of the key ingredients of the connection is that it doesn't transform like a tensor. That's what helps it correct the derivative, so that the derivative gives you a tensor. Do you think this part is helping at all? No. This is just tagging along. So what we can do is we can set this to zero. All right? So we set the torsion to zero, and that gives us a torsion-free tensor, or a torsion-free connection. OK? So what this means in application, and you might wonder, why, where are you going to use that? What it means is that whenever we're dealing with a connection, we will enjoy that symmetry. That I can interchange the two lower indices and it comes back to itself. Okay? This guy, if you interchange the two lower indices, you get minus what you started with. That's the anti-symmetric combination. The symmetric combination is where you interchange them and you get it back. Okay, so demanding that the connection be torsion free is really just saying, I want there to be an index symmetry on the two lower indices, and we're going to use that in just a minute. Okay? So here we go. That's E. Here's F, and F is going to give us our expression for lambda. Or, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. So here we go. D. Metric compatibility simply means that the derivative, or the, sorry, the covariant derivative of the metric is zero. Can you Sorry. Del mu of the, of the metric is zero. Sorry, say it again? Oh, did I say D? Oh, I totally meant F. Oh, yeah. It's like Don Parker, you know, D and F, they're just, no, cool. Yeah, I'm just kidding. So, sorry, thank you. I'm on F. I'm on F. F is for floor line, G is for dumbass. They're the same thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, here we go. All I'm going to do is I'm going to write this down three times. That's it. You ready? Okay, be prepared. I'm going to start with picking the order of these because I can change these, the, I can change the labelings here. Anyway, I don't want to make two of them the same. I want them all three to be different. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to write this down with different index assignments. So first I'm going to do row, mu, nu. So we're dealing with delta rho, g mu nu, which is of course delta rho, G mu nu minus, because the metric is a 0, 2 tensor, it has two dual vector indices. So I get minus gamma lambda rho mu G lambda nu minus gamma lambda rho nu G mu lambda. That I want to be 0. Let's do it again. This time, we're going to do mu, mu, rho. Same three 
the C, it's just different order. So literally, delta mu g mu rho equals d mu g mu rho minus gamma lambda mu nu g lambda rho minus gamma lambda mu rho g nu lambda equals zero. Okay? And one more time, this time in the order nu rho mu, del nu g rho mu equals partial nu g rho mu minus gamma lambda nu rho g lambda mu minus gamma lambda nu mu g rho lambda equals zero. Okay? Now, oh man, I did not evenly space these, but there's a reason. I have written these things out in exactly the index assignment that is our tensor transformation rule. However, now I'm going to go in and do a little bit of index relabeling. So for this term, I am going to call this gamma lambda rho mu g lambda nu. Paul. Paul? Yeah. Paul. What did I do? Get that. Uh, transpose things. Transpose what? The metric. I transpose the metric. Anything else? Oh, and the gamma. Yeah. The metric. Okay. So we're using the fact that the metric is symmetric. We know that. And we just proved that a torsion free connection is also symmetric. So I can reverse the order of these lower indices. I could have done just one, but I ended up doing both, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so that being said, let me go ahead and tell you what I'm going to do here. Here, I'm going to write this as gamma lambda rho nu g mu lambda. So I'm going to reverse both of those. And then for this guy, I'm going to reverse just the metric. Okay? Now what am I going to do? Equation one, we're going to subtract equation two, and then we're going to subtract equation three. What must that be equal to? Zero. zero. They're all three equal to zero, so this should be equal to zero. Well, here we go. We get d rho g mu nu minus d mu g nu rho minus d nu g mu rho mu plus two gamma lambda mu nu g nu rho. I mean, look, we're taking one and we're subtracting two, so this is going to cancel with this. That's why we did the reassignment. Another gamma is going to cancel with another gamma, and then two of the gammas are going to combine to give me this term. Okay? Now, what is so valuable about that? I can solve this for gamma. Gamma, sigma, mu nu is just this thing with a minus sign, because I move it to the other side of the equal sign divided by 2, divided by the metric. Of course, dividing by the metric is using the metric inverse. Okay. 
So there it is. There is our unique expression for the Christoffel connection, which is what we use to fix the derivative so that the derivative of a tensor is a tensor. It is given entirely in terms of derivatives of the metric. Times the endless metric, but the derivative part is just derivatives of the metric. Okay? All right. Let me show you. Let's take the space R2 with coordinates R and theta. We know that Vs squared is equal to Vr squared plus R squared V beta squared. Okay, which of course tells us that the metric is 1, 0, 0, R squared, and the inverse metric is 1, 0, 0, 1 over R squared. Okay? Everybody on board? Now, if you take these metrics, an inverse metric, and you do this calculation, which I'm not going to do in detail for you, I'll let you do it on your homework. But if you do these simple calculations, which is just take the derivative of the metric with respect to various coordinates, and then combine those sets of derivatives with the inverse, then what we will find is that there are some non-zero terms in the gammas. So the term with r theta theta is going to be equal to minus r. The term with theta r theta is going to be equal to the term with theta theta r, obviously, because these two are just related by the switching of the lower indices, so those have to be equal. This is going to be equal to 1 over r, and all the others are equal to 0. Okay? All right. Now, let's take delta mu v mu, and let's write it down. So we can first of all think of delta mu v mu as the Kronecker acting on del mu v mu, and now we can just use the standard definition of the covariant derivative of mu on nu, and then at the end we'll contract the indices. Okay? So we can write this as delta mu nu, v nu, v nu, plus gamma nu, mu, lambda, v, lambda, which is delta mu, v nu, because the chronic of delta on this just makes these two indices the same, plus gamma mu, mu, lambda, v, lambda, okay, because the delta mu nu on this is going to make this index and this index the same, I'll just call them mu's, okay, and then these are sums over the indices. Well, the indices take two values, r and theta. So I can just write these out explicitly. vr, vr, plus d theta, v theta, plus gamma r, 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 vr, plus gamma r, r theta, v theta, plus gamma theta, theta r, vr, plus gamma theta, 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 v theta. Okay. Again, all I'm doing is I'm saying these two indices have to be the same. R, 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 theta, 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 theta. And these two indices have to be the same. R, R, theta, theta, R, R, theta, theta. Okay. And now I just plug in the non-zero contributions.
anybody ever seen that before? Well, you've come close. You've come pretty hella close. What is this? I mean, this is a vector in R2. What is this thing right here? It's what? It's a gradient. That's on a scalar. What's the gradient operator acting on the vector call? Divergence. Yes, the divergence. <laughs> this is just L dot B. Okay? If you compare with E and M books, in E and M books, they write BR, BR plus 1 over R, B theta, B theta plus 1 over R, BR which is pretty damn close to this, except for that one over our turn in front of the B theta, B theta, okay? Well, it turns out that E and M books use an orthonormal basis. That is, E hat in the radial direction, e hat in the radial direction combined gives me one. And also, e hat in the theta direction combined with e hat in the theta direction gives me one. That is, the metric is one, zero, one. In our course, we use a coordinate adaptive basis. That is, e hat r dot e hat r equals 1, e hat theta dot e hat theta equals r squared, because our metric is given by 1, 0, 0, r squared. Now, of course, if we take the vector and we represent it by the components contracted with the basis, well, this has to be the same. If we're using, oh, hold on. No, no, I don't want these. Are, these are not orthogonal. Sorry. Sorry about that. The vector itself should not care whether you use a coordinate adaptive basis or an orthonormal basis. So these two expressions have to be the same. But this, of course, immediately tells us that vr is equal to vr hat, whereas v theta is equal to 1 over r v theta hat. So if I take v theta, and I call it 1 over rv theta hat, I get exactly this derivative. Okay? Now, I'm going to take a few minutes past time, maybe five, but you're going to appreciate this because now I'm going to explain to you what the hell's going on. First of all, you've seen this before. You've seen it whenever you've used spherical polar coordinates or even just polar coordinates in a plane. The derivative operator is no longer just the derivative. It's got these weird coefficients, and then it's got these damn terms. Where do they come from? They come from the co connection. Okay? Let me explain to you what is going on with a connection, and I think you'll all be able to absorb this because it's pictures, but I think this will make this make a lot more sense, and also all of the derivatives that you've worked with in electromagnetism will now make sense. Here we go. I'm going to start with the following lovely picture. So I'm going to call this E2, E1, and then I'm going to move up here. I'm going to call this E1, 
and I'm going to have my vector go here. Okay? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to draw another picture here where I'm going to have E1, E2, and then I'm going to have E1, E2, and then I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have this. I don't want this to be accurate. Okay? And here we go. Each covariant derivative has two terms. One comes from the derivative of the components, and the other one comes from the linear transformation of the components with the connection. So again, over here, all right? Now, I'm going to just make it a volunteer. What do you think this is equal to, zero or non-zero? That's the derivative of the components. If I, sorry, if I'm going to, so the derivative is measuring the change as I go from here to here. Okay? So are the components the same when I go from here to here? No, they're different. I mean, this has obviously got more of an E1 component than this does. So this is not zero. This describes the changing of the frame. Does the frame change? This is zero. Okay? Now we'll come here. What is this? Zero. If I got it right. Zero. It's zero, okay? The components stayed the same, but what happened to the frame? This is non-zero, okay? So in both cases, we have that delta mu v nu does not equal zero. So the vector changes. Now look, squint your eyes and ignore all this shit and just look at the two vectors. Are they the same vector? No. You can see that. This points in this direction, this points in this direction. They're different vectors. So the derivative better not be zero. Here it's not zero because the components are changing. Here it's not zero because the basis is changing. Now let me drive this point home with one more example. What's that equal to? Zero. Zero. What's that equal to? Zero. Zero. What's the covariant derivative of this vector? Zero. Zero. The vector doesn't change. What about that? Non -zero. This is non-zero. What about that? What about the covariant derivative of the vector? It's zero. The vector's the same. Okay? This is zero by measure. No, we couldn't understand your option. 
Okay, so the derivative encodes how the components change with respect to the basis. The connection, transforming the vector components, tells us how the basis is changing. Obviously, this is important if you're going to use polar coordinates. Because as you're all familiar with, the theta direction and the r direction change as you move around. Right? You all familiar with this? What this means is that this covariant derivative is important in flat space. This is flat space. Unless you're using rectangular coordinates, you can be in flat space, and unless you're using rectangular coordinates, the naive derivative of a tensor is not a tensor. You've got to correct the derivative even if you're in flat frickin' space. You should be familiar with that because you've got all of these derivatives that are in cylindrical coordinates and spherical polygons. Oh, that's all this story is telling you is how to calculate those. So you no longer have to accept the derivative in cylindrical coordinates. You can derive it. All you need is the metric. Because the metric is what gives you the Christoffel connection. And you know how the Christoffel connection acts on things now. Okay? Now I want to stress to you, this is not just for flat space. This is going to play an incredibly important role in curved space, obviously. Okay? Because one of the important observations in curved space is that the tangent spaces at different points are not aligned. They can't be. So in order to take a vector in one point of tangent space and compare it to a vector in another point in tangent space, we're going to have to have a reasonable means of doing that, and it's going to include this covariant derivative. And it's actually going to rely on a mechanism called parallel transport, which we'll talk about next time. That's it.